Joining me now is Michael Fanone, former D.C. Metropolitan Police Officer and author of Hold the Line, The Insurrection and One Cop's Battle for America's Soul. And Stuart Stevens, political strategist and senior advisor to the Lincoln Project. Uh, Michael Fanone, thank you so much for being here. Yes, ma'am. Um, so let, let's talk about this, because there were a few things um, about this that literally infuriated me as I listened to Donald Trump in Ohio over the weekend. But one of the most galling was his promise to release into American civil society hundreds, and I guess at this point more than a thousand, incarcerated January 6th defendants. Let me play for you what you said about those people, and you confronted one of them who's now incarcerated for trying to assault you. This is how you testified before Congress. On that day, I participated in the defense of the United States Capitol from an armed mob, an armed mob of thousands determined to get inside because I was among the vastly <clears throat> outnumbered group of law enforcement officers protecting the Capitol and the people inside it. I was grabbed, beaten, tased, all while being called a traitor to my country. I was at risk of being stripped of and killed with my own firearm as I heard chants of kill him with his own gun. I could still hear those words in my head today. One of the men uh, who did that to you is named Daniel D.J. Rodriguez. He's serving 12 years, 12 years and seven months behind bars. Trump says he's going to let him out. What do you make of his plan, his plan to do that? It's outrageous. Um, but again, I, I think we've all said the words outrageous, disgusting, disgraceful so many times when it comes to Donald Trump and the things that he says and does. Um, I, I just think it's important that we um, reiterate to Americans, potential Trump supporters, who these people are, uh, who the individuals incarcerated uh, for their crimes on January 6th are. These are individuals who violently attacked law enforcement officers at the Capitol. And if that's something you support is the release of those individuals, uh, I think you've got, you know, more issues than um, than just uh, your uh, supporting Donald Trump. I, I mean, you serve as a law enforcement officer. You were doing your job when you showed up. It actually wasn't your job. You're a Metropolitan Police Officer. You weren't a Capitol Police Officer. You answered the call to come and help people, to try to uh, chip in and help. When you hear Donald Trump, he's now changed the national anthem. He doesn't play the regular national anthem or get someone to sing the national anthem. He plays those people who are locked up for assaulting you and other officers. He plays that as the national anthem and then does this announcement about the wrongfully incarcerated hostages. He uses the term hostages. Just as a former law enforcement officer, how do you feel when you hear that? I mean, it, it, it pisses me off. But I, again, I think we have to you know, look beyond just Donald Trump and his rhetoric. He says these things because it resonates with his base. And who is his base? Um, you know, I, I think these are Americans who do not appreciate or understand democracy. Uh, they don't care about our um, constitutional republic. These are people who believe wholeheartedly that the ends justify the means. They want to win. Uh, they don't care about the diverse opinions of other Americans, their fellow countrymen. Uh, their only concern is, uh, is winning and forcing uh, their view or, or their idea of what American America is on the rest of us. Yeah. Um, Stuart Stevens, the other piece of this is that it's it is incredibly ironic that people who are claiming that millions of undocumented migrants are coming over the border specifically to commit crimes and murder people when those people literally are desperate for work and a lot of them are paying smugglers back so they have to work, right? So they come in here and they look for jobs and they're doing all the construction work and all the agricultural work. They are now cheering the idea that actual criminals who are on tape and who were dumb enough to live stream their crimes, who were caught in some cases because their own family members turned them in, who beat and savaged police officers and were proud of it at the time while waving the Trump flag with the American flag. I guess they don't know which one is the actual national flag. Those people would then be released into the general population. I seem to recall that's what just happened in Haiti. The gangs in Haiti, the first thing they did before taking over that country was open the jails and release 3,500 of the hardest core members of their gangs, the most violent members of their gangs, and put them out into the street to terrorize people. Donald Trump is saying he's going to do that. 
And this is supported, I guess, by the Republican Party leadership. Yeah, uh, first, I've never had a chance to thank Michael. Um, I, I just like to do it personally. Um, that was a, a extraordinarily uh, courageous stand that you and, and your, your other officers took. And if you haven't read his book, it, it really is a hell of a book. Um, and, and everybody should go out and read it. It is. Um, you know, I, I joined a party that said it believed in law and order, and that's just a farce now. You know, I, Michael's right. It's really not about Donald Trump. It's about the whole Republican Party and the people who are supporting Trump. And you can't say that these people don't have information. They don't have, you know, or they have to listen to Fox or they have to listen to some, you know, lunatic uh, on OAN or go down some rabbit hole on the Internet. They have the same ability to discern, to make decisions. There's a lot more information out there now than at any time before in the history of the country. And yet it's, it's really about values. And this is why I call this book I wrote. It was all a lie because I don't know any other conclusion to come to that you say all these things that we said in the Republican Party, character counts, law and order, support the blue, all of these things, they were just marketing slogans. And when push comes to shove, most Republican leaders have just either supported it or quietly stepped aside, which is the same thing. What do you think that they're getting? What does Mitch McConnell get out of endorsing this? What do any of these people get? Because Mike Pence, and he was the most sycophantic Trump, Trump supporter there was. Even he says it's too much. What is Mitch McConnell? What do they what do they think they're getting out of this? You know, it's an extraordinarily important question. Um, you know, one thing you can say about most politicians is they have really big egos, which doesn't really bother me, certain musicians, actors. And you would think that they would stop and look at how am I going to be remembered here in history? I mean, this is it. You can't say that Mitch McConnell's doing it so he can win his next primary. And yet he won't even see Donald Trump's name allowed. And let's don't forget, Mitch McConnell could have just brought an end to this. If he had supported convicting the president of impeachment, he would have been convicted. And then he went out and gave this speech. I think it's sort of a, a complete collapse of a party that has convinced itself that there is some other evil that is worth sacrificing their own values for. And they get together and they all, you know, mobs like comfort. And they tell themselves that this is what we have to do. And, you know, it takes some, I got to give Pence credit. I've never been a Mike Pence fan, but, um, you know, he's done the right thing here. And just not many other Republican leaders have. Yeah. If Mike Pence is braver than you, then you're in trouble. Um, just as a former law enforcement professional, walk me through what happens when people who've been convicted of violent crimes, not just regular crimes, not just trespassing crimes, but the people who are actually in prison, these are the most violent of the insurrectionists. What does it look like when they're free as a bird and pardoned? Well, first of all, I mean, it sends a message to uh, anyone who has um, committed acts of violence on behalf of the former president uh, that you will be supported uh, and ultimately pardoned or released from prison. So it's carte blanche. If you want to go out and commit acts of violence, as long as you're doing it uh, for Donald Trump, um, you've got no, at least no criminal uh, culpability, no fears of, of prosecution. Um, I, I mean, as a former law enforcement officer, someone who was there on January 6th, the message that it would send to me and, and to the police officers like myself that responded that day, um, our country has betrayed us uh, and that your sacrifices are um, not valued. Uh, and I, you know, it's not the first time that I've... Um, encountered those feelings as a cop, but uh, having it sanctioned by the president of the United States to me is um, a bridge too far, not something that I can uh, can live with. Would you feel safe knowing that members of the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters and Boogaloo Boys, who, by the way, some of them, those members have been accused of directly shooting police officers. Would you feel safe with those guys looking for migrants in a city you lived in? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, these are vigilantes. And, and I think it's important, too, that we go back and look at the makeup of many of these individuals. You know, these guys, like the guys that assaulted me, um, Daniel Rodriguez, uh, Kyle Young, uh, Albuquerque, Cosper Head, 
Uh, you know, these people had criminal histories before they went to the Capitol that day. They weren't law abiding citizens. You know, many of these individuals had prior convictions for uh, domestic violence, abuse, assault, um, you know, drug trafficking, narcotics crimes, possession, uh, all these different uh, crimes. These were not upstanding law abiding citizens to begin with. Uh, so the idea that you would have them um, <laughs> playing a role as law enforcement officers in this country is uh, outrageous. And that is what uh, one of the two major candidates for president is promising to do. Michael Fanone, and I thank you as well. I've thanked you before for what you did on that day, but I'll just thank you again because it is the right thing to do. And my friend, Stuart Stevens, thank you both for being here. I ran and everybody knew I was a rich person. I built a great company. And then they had, oh, but he'll never put in his financials because maybe he's not as rich as people think. Not that it matters, but I'm much richer. I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I don't need anybody's money. I'm using my own money. I'm not using the lobbyists. I'm not using donors. I don't care. I'm really rich. The idea that Trump is a billionaire was the original big lie. In fact, it helped make him president. Well, surprise, surprise, it turns out he's not as rich as he claimed to be. Trump's lawyers informed the court today that he has not been able to secure a bond for the $464 million judgment against him and his co-defendants in the New York civil fraud trial. His lawyers now say that getting a bond in the full amount is a, quote, practical impossibility after reaching out to some 30 companies. They say it is they say that that's because most companies will not accept his properties as collateral and instead are looking for cash to cover the bond. The clock is ticking for Trump with only one week left to post the bond or New York Attorney General Letitia James can start seizing his assets, which she said she's ready to do. And this is the inherent problem with a man running for president who's increasingly desperate for money because who knows what he might do to find it from potentially looting the RNC, thanks to his newly installed loyalists, including his daughter-in-law, to getting help from some of his foreign dictator friends, to launching fresh rounds of disinformation to bamboozle his way back into the White House. Joining me now is Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney, professor at the University of Michigan Law School, and author of the New York Times best-selling new book, Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America. First off, congratulations, Barb, on the new book. Uh, very exciting and very important. Disinformation. And I, t I, I wanted to go back to that first lie because Donald Trump used the ruse of him being super wealthy to attract a lot of supporters. And the fact that he was famous also helped. That is now falling apart in the wake of him being called to the carpet to produce the cash. What do you make of the possibility that he might end up having to cough up some property? Yeah, you know, he has always campaigned on this idea that I am not beholden to anybody. I don't need donors. I don't need uh, money from anybody because I'm independently wealthy. I'm, I'm rich. He, sa he says it all the time. Well, it turns out he's not. And it turns out the only reason he was able to amass this fortune is because it was built on a foundation of lies. That's what was exposed in this case. And so now he owes more than $450 million. And, Joy, the reason a bond is required when somebody wants to appeal is because that money is now due and owing to the taxpayers of the state of New York. And so if he wants to delay an appeal, that's fine. But he has to put the money up because it's designed to avoid someone filing a frivolous appeal just for the purpose of delaying the payout. Now, he says 30 lenders of bonds have said, we can't provide you with a bond. You're not a good credit risk. Well, that's the very reason that the state wants this bond. He's trying to offer uh, a discount of putting up $100 million. And I think the, the court wisely says no, for the same reasons these uh, surety bond companies say you're not a good risk. The court doesn't think he's a good risk either. And so uh, I think this is a last ditch effort to try to get some grace and some stay. But I think ultimately he's going to have to sell some properties. You know, imagine if you said, I know I owe you some money, but it's tied up in my car and my house and some other things, so I can't really pay it. You got to sell the stuff. Yeah. And so I think that if he doesn't, Letitia James can begin on March 25th to actually seize assets. And so if he wants to have his choice of what to sell, uh, he needs to act before then. Uh, but, but now, having pervade being on The Apprentice and people perceiving him as, a, you know, the people's billionaire, now he's been president. 
which has afforded him a lot of latitude in terms of avoiding all of these court cases, which is now down to 88 count criminal counts. But there's also this other thing that's happened is that he's created a cult of personality. So now people don't even believe that Joe Biden is president. The, the numbers are really actually frightening. Um, 36 percent in a Washington Post poll don't believe that Joe Biden is even the president of the United States. And we're seeing this kind of disinformation really ratcheted up. It was ratcheted up in 2016. It's how he became president. The first time Russia got involved and did it, we're now seeing AI used. What is the risk of disinformation in the upcoming election? Oh, I think it's enormous, Joy. I think, you know, it, we, we've seen these tactics of authoritarians for decades with, you know, repetition and conspiracy theories and big lies and other things. But Donald Trump has something at his disposal that Hitler and Mussolini didn't have, and that's social media, mm -hmm. truth social, artificial intelligence. And so I think we are going to be bombarded with all kinds of false claims. You know, the normalizing of violence by talking about bloodbaths, uh, revisionist history by talking about January six attackers as hostages. And, and I worry about even other things. Uh, you know, one of the strategies of the corrupt is not to uh, exonerate themselves from their corruption, but to portray everyone else in the system right. as corrupt. And I, I fear that's what we're going to see is all kinds of smear campaigns against Joe Biden so that you can say, well, look, everybody's corrupt. Uh, so you might as well pick the one who shares your worldview, because if everybody's corrupt, then corrupt corruption doesn't matter. Right. And that is literally what he got impeached for the first time, was trying to create a ruse that Biden was doing some corruption with Ukraine because he was doing funny stuff uh, with Russia. Do you consider it part of the disinformation campaign for Trump to flip these ideas to say that it's Biden who's the threat to democracy, to take the language of hostages, which we think about the Israeli hostages and other hostages being held by Hamas, but say, no, no, that's actually the people in prison. It, do you consider that to be part of a disinformation campaign? Absolutely, which is why I use the phrase disinformation and not lies, because disinformation mm -hmm. isn't just false claims. It is manipulation. It's using information to mislead or manipulate the public. And sometimes uh, it, it even is based on truth. But one of the things I think Donald Trump is doing is you'll hear this from time to time. He anything he's accused of, he accuses his opponent of, because what right. he's trying to do is to neutralize that issue. You know, when when he was caught with uh, documents in his home, he said Obama took documents. Well, you know, it's Turns out Obama had uh, the permission of the National Archives to store them at his presidential library. Um, but you'll hear that all the time. And the effort, I think, is to take the sting out of the accusation right. so that people think that's not a big deal. Everybody does it. I wish we had more time because uh, I wanted to ask you about Manafort being back on the scene. But we'll just have to bring you mm. back. Uh, but I will just congratulate okay. you again on your best-selling book. Thank you so much for being here, Barbara McQuaid. Much appreciated.